And please don't say, oh, my dog loves my sister's dog. They come over every Christmas. Please take life events into consideration and medical and age and all these things and never, never, never assume. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Dog Sense. I am your host, Kathy Santo, and I am joined by my co-host all the way in Colorado, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hi, guys. All right, so this is a topic that we deal with every single day, their own dogs, students' dogs, and it is a big problem. People just don't understand how to introduce dogs who may not have great social skills. And I think that maybe they don't even know what that looks like, right? right? What does it really look like when a dog does a greeting? So, you know what? I think before we work on the challenge, let's talk about Mm -hmm. what the steps are that a dog needs to go through to properly greet another dog. So the first step is the dog has to see the other dog, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when he sees it, that's the point where that dog says, this is a problem or, ooh, it's a friend. Or they're like, or they can be like, (laughs) I don't know how to feel like, I'm not sure. Right. And like the way that you said that I saw the body language in my head. Right. And that's what we want you guys to do too. When you said, I don't know if this is going to go or you said, Oh, hi. Like I saw the body language in my head. And that's what we guys want you to be able to do as well, because your dog is always throughout this whole greeting process. Your dog is communicating something, whether or not you're actually reading the body language cues, they're telling you exactly how they feel. Right. Which is why when people say all of a sudden it just went sideways, What we think is it's because you didn't understand what they were saying. So let us educate you because it absolutely didn't come out of the blue. All right. So first step is C. Second step is the approach. Now, Mm -hmm. how your dog approaches another dog is really going to color the experience. So if your dog approaches them like a linebacker coming at him 100 (laughs) miles an hour, right? Like, ah, the other dog is likely going to say, oh, hell yeah, right? Or (laughs) maybe worse, the dog is going to go, yeah, bring it. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. So that's no good. I was talking to Sarah earlier and I was saying, if my border collie and I were walking and another dog in person came around a corner and surprised us, that Mm -hmm. would be a better approach for him than it would be if it were a long distance approach. If he saw Mm -hmm. a dog at a distance, he might be like, ooh, I'm a hurting breed. Let me size you up. Maybe I should crouch down and stalk you, right? So, and that could that could unnerve another dog. Yeah. So yeah. the approach really matters. The speed of it, the angle of it. Are they coming face to face? Are they coming off to the side? Like it, it really does matter. And you can help move that along. So what comes next? It's my favorite. The news. That's my least favorite. This is, yeah, this is where I break out in hives, guys. All right. So so now we've done the approach. We've got a neutral. Everything looks good. Body language is awesome. Now we go to the nose to nose greeting, right? That's usually the first place dogs will initially say hello. Yeah. And so you want to look for tension. We're thinking about the duration and you're looking at their response. So, so many times we see one dog owner looking at their dog and they're like, Look at my dog. He's having such a great experience. So happy, right? You know what the other dog is saying? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my exactly. God. He's touching me. And they're like, look, take a picture. It's Instagram. It's a real, right? And the other dog is dying. That's going to be a problem because the other dog is having a bad experience and your dog is having a good experience and it's not yeah. fair. So again, yeah. the body language is so important for you to understand this. Mm-hmm. So that if your dog is being too forward, even if he's being nice, but it's too much for the other dog, get him out of there, move it along. Yeah. And as you're learning this, right, as you're starting to learn what each body language cue means, a general rule, your nose to nose sniffing should last a couple of seconds. And then an appropriate greeting that's going well, a lot of times the dogs will then move to butt sniffing, right? It's a couple of seconds, then they move to the butt sniffing. If it's, if you're you're holding your breath and you're starting to like, you're not able to breathe, it's gone on too long and you need to make some movement to help it not. Because again, that nose to nose, if a fight's going to happen, that's that's, that's where it's going to happen in the greeting, right? It's going to be the nose to nose that went on for too long. And people are going to say how long they want a recipe. It's not like, it's not like they can say, oh, when you wash your hands, sing the ABC song and then you're right, done, right. right? It's not like that. It's not a two-minute egg. It's 
dependent on the dog. And I do want to say, Sarah, that the dog you have right this minute may not be the dog you have in two hours or two days, right? So it's just like people, you're having a good day today, you're not having a good day tomorrow. So you make sure that you're addressing the actual dog in front of you, not the dog you want to have, not the dog you wish to have, not the dog you used to have. It has to be the dog right in front of you. And be honest. Mm -hmm. And if you feel in your gut, like this is going so well, get out of Dodge. There's nothing wrong with that. And then from the butt sniffing, that's where we go into either appropriate Mm -hmm. play, inappropriate play, or disengagement. Now, disengagement is interesting because it doesn't always look like a dog leaving. Sometimes it could be a dog sitting there and scratching his collar. And Mm -hmm. you're like, your collar's fine, buddy. He's like, yeah, that's my stress (laughs) signal. It's like you texting. Somebody's close talking. You're like, oh, important text time. There's no text, right? But you're trying to look busy. A dog will sniff the ground. They'll sniff their Mm -hmm. genitals. They'll like be like, I got something to do right now. And sometimes they can't leave Sarah because the owner is holding the leash and forcing them into that. So if you see that, let your dog move away and you need to move them out of the situation too. Yeah. Respect what they're saying, right? It's a dog. I did this with a client the other day in the lesson we were doing walk greeting stuff. And the other dog, she was being polite. She was, you know, she was tolerating, she was being neutral, but she in no way wanted to actually say hello to that other dog. She wanted to be neutral. Right. And so that's a, she, again, she set the tone, your body language is telling me you don't want to go into play, right? You keep trying to disengage. Meanwhile, the other dog is being a little bit inappropriate, which we had to interrupt, but listen to your dog, respect what they're telling you when you guys are trying to work on these greetings between either social dogs or dogs with not so great social skills. Yeah. And your goal should be a safe interaction. Yep. And if you're shooting a movie and you need this to happen, maybe go to some stock footage and video. <laughs> places, right? don't, don't force the interaction. Absolutely. No, it doesn't have to happen. So if been like your dog may want it and the other doesn't let it go. The other one exactly. may want it and your dog doesn't. Don't force your dog. And I see that too, Sarah. It's like when you yeah. have a kid and you're like, oh, shake his hand, like be social, right? Don't do that because right. you don't know. You don't know. You may have missed the super subtle body language from the other dog that said mm-hmm. to your dog, if you come any closer, I'm going to cut you, right? And your dog is like, oh my God. You're like, go see Fluffy, go yeah. see. And the other dog is like, come on, dude. But you don't know what you're looking at. Yeah, come on. Fluffy wants to say hi. Fluffy says, one more inch, come here. And your dog is going, please get me out of here. Yeah. So we've done the whole, we did a quick little nose to nose. We did some butt, sniff, butt sniffing. Now we're getting into, we're not, we don't really think that they want to go right into play. They didn't go into appropriate, fair and balanced play. So we're going to err on the side of caution. And we're going to say, let's, let's work on neutral behavior towards each other. Right. We're going to work on coexisting. We don't necessarily have to be play buddies. And that's a, usually a human thing, right? That's like, I want this to happen right now because you watch too many movies and you think that's how it happens and it doesn't. (laughs) So for the walk, what we want to see on there is neutral towards each other, right? Let them kind of make choices. If one wants to go over and sniff a little bit and the other one doesn't seem too offended by it, sure, let that happen. Reward the neutral behavior um, and make sure that no one's being too pushy, right? Because if they're being too pushy on a walk, I'm not going to then let them go off leash in the backyard or in the house, right? Right. We need to get the neutral behavior towards each other. Maybe make sure that we can get some commands in if we need, right? Can I tell my dog, leave it? Can I recall them back to me? Can I tell them an emergency down despite that other dog being there? I want to make sure that we have a neutral response to each other, but then also I can ask for a command if I need it, if this goes south. Yeah, you want to make sure that that interaction, that communication that you have with the dog is solid. And actually... I like the idea that the dog is checking back with you without even needing to, because he's telling you, he sees the value in you being greater than the value in the other dog. And obviously there's a walk. So we're talking about outside. I try not to do them in close, tight spaces. You know, Mm -hmm. like if you're, if you're in a parking lot, right. Don't you both go between the same parked cars, right? right? right. Because now you're in an alleyway. Um, Doorways can be issues like anything that could create more stress and tension. So that's why a walk is so good because it's the big open space. And if you don't have a field, like, like I said, go to a parking lot, just make sure not yeah. to get into any tight areas. Yeah. And also before, so the next step to this would be, you know, to, if you have a backyard or something to go into the backyard, let them hang out and stuff, but you might have to do that neutral walk over the span of a couple of days or even a couple of weeks, depending on, again, your dog's body language, what they're telling you, right? It might not just be one walk. Then 10 minutes later, you go in the backyard and then 10 minutes later, you're then going inside the house off leash, expecting them to be totally fine. Right. So take your time with this. 
And I like the idea that the owners understand now because they're listening to this. You have to be present. Yeah. It's not like kids. You're like, oh, go oh. play in the backyard for a few hours. It's exactly. Like- Here we go. Your dogs are not going to figure it out right? Don't expect, again, sure, the rare few, sometimes, yeah, they'll figure it out. But majority of dogs do not put them in the backyard and say, oh, they'll figure it out. You are going to come back to a bloodbath. Yeah, there's, and, and your dog could get bullied and your dog could become a bully. And if your dog doesn't have exposure to lots of different dogs and different ways dogs look, they have no idea how to read yeah. it, right? So a good example is any dog with, they call it a prick ear, like a shepherd, like a Doberman, right? Like a schnauzer, a Frenchie. If your dog has never seen this, Mm -hmm. it looks to them like the dog is staring at them because their ears are up, right? It's like bad Botox when somebody's like this. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And you're like, what? And they're like, what? What? Like, that's how they look. But if your dog doesn't know that, then the problem is they feel threatened by it. And then it's either like, holy hell, are you threatening me? Or it's like, oh yeah, your mother. And then Mm -hmm. it's a go time. But but the Frenchie is just like, I look like this. I can't help it. (laughs) If if they don't know how to read the body language of a dog who doesn't have a tail. Like think of the little bulldogs, a little corkscrew tail. Or think about the dogs with no neck. Like there's so much variety. And if you're not there to interpret it and to be the interpreter for this little dance that they're doing, you're going to have problems like Sarah said. All right. So if we've got, so we've got neutral walks, we've done it a couple of times. Body language looks good. We think they're going to be okay in the backyard, right? So if you do have a backyard, you're able to do this. That would most likely be the next step. Have everyone drag their leashes and you're still very closely supervising, right? If they do go nose to nose to sniff, if it doesn't end after a couple of seconds, you're going in there and you're creating some movement or you're recalling one of the dogs back to you. You're still practicing your commands. You're making sure that your dog can still listen to you despite this other dog being around. And I want to point out that Sarah at no point, and I haven't either, has mentioned toys. We're not throwing balls. Number one, if you throw a ball and the two dogs run after it, at minimum, they could get injured by hip yeah. checking each other or sliding. But what we're really worried about is resource guarding or yeah. grabbing it and then get snapping it. Like, like, no, if you had yeah. kids coming over to play, would you have one toy? No, you'd have a lot of toys. But in this case, I want no toys because they're not children, yeah. they're dogs. And we don't want any protectiveness. The dog who owns the house doesn't necessarily want to share his toys. Your kids probably didn't yeah. either. So really take that into consideration. And while we're talking about resources, Sarah, people think resources are bones and toys, but let them in on the truth. What else are resources? So we want to set the dogs up for success, right? We want to make sure that this interaction goes as well as it possibly can without any fights breaking out because we don't want to have to then go back and do damage control. So a resource could be, again, yes, it could be food. It could be toys. It can also be personal space. It could be you. It could be their bed. It could be a water bowl, right? That same water bowl that is out 24 seven and has never been an issue before that empty food bowl, right? That doesn't even have any food in it, right? That could be a resource. And we would say when you're then ready to move into the house, you pick everything up, right? You pick up the food bowls, the water bowls, any toys and bones that that one's an obvious one, but maybe beds, maybe their favorite spot in the couch, right? You make sure that both dogs aren't getting stuck then in that tight space between the couch and the coffee table, right? Or going under the dining room table. Tight spaces can also be a moment where a fight will break out because they're guarding not only objects and stuff, but their personal space or even you as well. This summer I had a student and her sister's dog was over and her dog, and and they had known each other previous to this and they had a great interaction and they were Mm -hmm. outside, they were inside, everything was going well. And she opened the, you know, the trash that's under the sink. She opened the the door, she pulled out the trash. She went to drop a paper towel in it. It didn't go in. And Mm -hmm. her dog went for the paper towel. And the other dog said, oh no, that's my paper towel. And she had a dog fight right in front of the sink that these dogs Mm -hmm. had been there for hours getting along. And the first thing I said was, okay, did they have any breaks from each other? Did they get to rest? Did they get to decompress? No, they did not. So something that would have probably never even occurred to Mm -hmm. them at the end of a very long day, think about yourselves how you have, you're at max capacity during the day and then some little things happen and it just blows you up. It wouldn't happen eight hours ago, but these dogs are at capacity. So that's another thing. You need to make sure Mm -hmm. they have separate time, take a break in the crate somewhere, decompress, just everybody's in. 
and things yeah. will be a lot, go a lot smoother. Yeah. With the interactions are going well, you want them, you want to end on a good note, right? You want to end while the dogs are still enjoying each, each other's company. Nothing bad has happened. And again, they just need that break sometimes. It could be a lot for maybe one of the dogs to be tolerating this much and they're doing awesome. They're doing really well, but they need that break to decompress. So let's say you take that break. So the next time they are together, you would slowly start to increase the amount of time they are together. But again, you're still constantly supervising this stuff because we want to avoid the fight from happening in the first place. Um, so we don't have to then do damage control on that. They can earn more freedom together. They can earn more time together, but they have to show you that they can handle it. And please don't say, oh, my dog loves my sister's dog. They come over every Christmas. <laughs> There's 364 days in between that. They change. It's not like yeah. your phone. It's not like the app you load. It's always going to be the same. Get a little update. It gets better, right? Yeah. No. The dog could now have arthritis or a rotten tooth. Yeah. Or they could have to fight in the car all the way driving to your house. And the dog is super mm-hmm. stressed. So please take life events into consideration yeah. and medical and age and all these things and never, never, never assume that your dog right. is going to still be the same dog he was when they were together last Christmas. Also, maturity is a big one too, especially right with all these pandemic puppies that happen, right? If your adult dog was okay with your sister's puppy, if it's now been a year and it's now an adult dog, you need to go through this process all over again, right? Maybe you have to go a little bit more quickly through it, but don't take it for granted that they were fine last time. Go through these steps every time you then, it, when they then interact, if it's only happening maybe one or two times a year. And big gaps in age can be big yeah. problems. A really young dog, yeah. really old dog. I mean, just use common sense. Learn your dog body language. Write all these steps down. Make sure you understand it. And you go through them. Don't skip a step. Make sure none of these violations of resources are happening. Make sure the dogs get active rest and you will have successful dog interactions. All right, guys, as always, if you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd like, rate, subscribe, tell a friend, and share this episode with people who need to hear it. Our mission with this podcast is to continue creating an awesome community of dog lovers and learners. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, guys.